Do tyre pressure monitoring systems actually need calibration? TPMS, the ultimate beer garden engineer's owner's guide. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Here's a question from a dude named Tim. Possibly a dudette, it's all very confusing in the 21st century. Anyway, regarding the TPMS on his 2017 Subaru Impreza S. The manual says that if I get my tyres rotated or if my sensors are reading one value and my own tyre pressure gauge reads another, I should take my car to the dealership for calibration. Isn't this illegal in Australia? The manual doesn't list any way the end user can reset or recalibrate the TPMS system. Okay, so our hero Tim writes me this detailed autobiography on this whole problem. All these sordid details, it's very graphic indeed. He tells me he takes care of his car, he checks every two weeks the fluids and the tyres, and that's really good. More people should do that and be responsible. I've done a whole report on those three critical checks. It's kind of uh, up there somewhere. Tim says he has a bunch of tyre pressure gauges, and I'm not sure if that's a metric bunch or an imperial bunch, but anyway, it's rather a lot. Apparently, they all read pretty much the same pressure, but the tyre pressure monitoring system reads about 3 to 5 psi higher than all of those gauges. In other words, the tyres are actually at 32 psi, Tim says, but the TPMS says 35 to 37. Hashtag bastard. The barbed wire enema in this situation for Tim is, quote, having to fork out dollars at the dealership every time I get my tyres changed or rotated to get the TPMS reset. Clearly, Tim has TPMS PTSD, post-traumatic dealership stress. It can strike anyone down at any time. It's a silent killer. Obviously, you need a quick TPMS reset when you get the tyres rotated, okay? Because otherwise, the car has no way of knowing the sensor that was formerly on the left front or something is now actually on the left rear or whatever. It's just not that smart. The recalibration process here is merely a matter of telling the car where the sensors are now, and it's like a five-minute job with a scan tool, okay? So I'm not so sure, at least in any case, that individual sensors can be recalibrated in the context of adjusting the pressure reading that they deliver to the car for any given pressure state of the tyre. The recalibration process there is likely, at least in some cases, to be the total replacement of that faulty sensor. Tim adds, Are you able to shed light on this at all? And if you made it this far, thanks for putting up with this. Cheers. No problem, Tim. Thank you for reaching out. Now, up front, I don't think it's illegal for an owner's manual to say, take the car into the dealership for recalibration in these circumstances. There are plenty of servicing jobs that are simply outside the remit of the car owner, him or herself. And this is just one of those jobs. Car makers always recommend the authorised dealer but they can't extort this, you know, using the threat of voiding your warranty as leverage. That would be illegal. And that didn't sound like such a demand to me from Subaru to you, go to the dealership. It's a recommendation, more of an active voice recommendation, I think. You'd almost certainly find an independent servicing dude or dudette, perhaps even a hottie, but they generally charge extra, so there's that. Who can do this job for you? But you'll still have to pay for it, right? Nobody does this stuff like a charity. And look, TPMS is a net benefit to you. But the feedback effect here of added complexity is the cost of occasional calibration. So you just have to deal with that. Just to put this in perspective, okay? TPMS might save your life by preventing a blowout and we'll get to that. But the feedback effect, the bad news component, if you like, is that occasional calibration of the system is required. 
that's still a net plus to you. And whoever does it, they will need to capture the signals from the in-wheel sensors and plug some scan tool or PC into the car itself via the onboard diagnostics port and let the mad recalibrating voodoo happen. Yes. I'd get quotes if the Steeler ship wants to charge you an arm and a leg for doing this. Ring a couple of independents, make sure you get one hottie, and compare the prices. It's a specific, very tightly defined job, so they should be able to tell you how much very easily. I don't think Tim should actually bother recalibrating at this point, however, but he certainly can if he wants to. TPMS for dummies, okay? There are two kinds. The older indirect kind, which is based on precise speed measurements of the wheel, and the newer direct kind, which uses a pressure transducer in the wheel. It's actually part of the valve assembly with the pressure sensing wireless transmitting gizmo inside the rim, kind of below ground, subterranean, if you like. Anyway, you can't see it from out here. Subaru uses that second, more high-tech kind. From memory, they use Schrader electronics sensors. If your car is displaying real-time pressures, you've got that second direct TPMS kind, the kind with the pressure transducer in the wheel. It's essentially a sensor, right, which is a pressure voltage transducer that converts pressure to electricity, plus an analog to digital converter and an RF transmitter, which an ECU connected to the CAN bus in the car receives wirelessly and decodes. Sorry about all the jargon. If your head is spinning, it's just black magic. And thank you very much, Arthur C. Clarke, for that very fine distinction all those years ago. In the case here, where there's merely a minor difference between the TPMS indicated pressure and the real pressure, why bother calibrating? You could just live with the offset, right? Take speedos, okay? Most people know that 106 k's an hour or something indicated on their speedo equals 100 k's an hour actual road speed. And we live with this all day long. It's just doing business normally, right? You can confirm this offset with a GPS receiver. It varies from car to car slightly, but once you know what the real speed versus indicated speed offset is for your car, you can derive at 106 indicated all day long, you cruise down the freeway like that and not get pulled over and get from A to B as fast as legally possible. So that's nice. This is just like that. Tim knows that 35 to 37 PSI indicated by onboard TPMS equals 32 PSI actual. He just needs to make friends with the concept that normal equals a displayed pressure in that region of 35 to 37. So if there's suddenly a reading on the dashboard of 28 or something, that's bad. The other thing to consider here, I guess, is the pressure in the tyres rises with operating and ambient temperature. A 10 degree C rise in temperature is about a 3% increase in absolute temperature, relative to absolute zero. That equals a 3% increase in pressure, ballpark, because basic gas physics in the beer garden, that's how this works. Absolute pressure in the tyre is about 45 psi, ballpark, above a vacuum. So 10 degree C is an increase of about 1.5-ish. PSI. So part of the discrepancy here, the 35 to 37 sort of variation, could simply be pressure temperature related for the tyres actually as they operate. Back when I was the world's shittest engineer, okay, I worked in a laboratory where we broke stuff. It was quite therapeutic and I was most adept at it. In fact, breaking stuff was my thing. Give me anything, even today, and I can break it for you. Calibration here was an ongoing big deal, right? Because the, the lab was NATA certified. So in the techo world, calibration works like this. You apply a known condition, like a load, to some device, maybe 100 kilonewtons, which that's in the ballpark of about 10 tonnes. And then you measure the reading on the device, and it might say 104 kilonewtons or something. And you might then apply 200 kilonewtons in the same precisely controlled way, and it might read 
I don't know, 208 simplistically. And then you know that you are about 4% out between those readings, right? And you can interpolate it precisely so that when you break stuff in that 100 to 200 kilonewton range, you take direct measurements off the device itself. And then you apply your 4% correction factor to those final results. That makes sense, right? So if you break something at 156 kilonewtons indicated, then it's a safe bet the failure actually occurred at 150. Rinse and repeat all day long for fun and profit. Miraculously enough, you get an actual result here despite the offset on the gauge or the graph and its inherent inaccuracy. And this is exactly what many of us do with our speedos and GPS, right? Measurement plus or minus correction factor, the offset, you just deal with that and it equals the true value that you're trying to read. So I'd suggest that you don't need to calibrate your TPMS system in these situations because of some minor variance, because you simply don't need to know your tire's exact operating pressures in real time. That's kind of worthless information. Like, you know, we're not really sending men to Mars here. We're trying to prevent an undetected in-service pressure loss going bad in the worst possible way and causing a blowout, perhaps at freeway speeds. What you really need to know and what TPMS is sensational at telling you is if one tire starts to lose air significantly. If you've got three tires all reading 38 up on the dashboard and one reading 24, that's bad. You gotta do something about it now. Exciting new blowout coming soon to a road near you. Alternatively, this is a blowout looking for a place to happen, okay? And without TPMS on a freeway, you may not feel anything until that tire fails catastrophically. The big strength of TPMS is that it will alert you to that slow leak, which is the major cause of blowouts on the highway. Gradual pressure loss makes the sidewalls sag, and they flex a lot more than they're designed to in this condition, and they get hot thanks to hysteresis, yes, which we covered recently, link just up there, which is the classic blowout failure mechanism, thank you very much, overheated sidewall. So there's that. Partial deflation is also an advertisement for extreme dynamic instability in a severe swerve or during an emergency stop. The lateral inertial loads in these kinds of maneuvers can even roll the tire off the rim if it's partially deflated, breaking the bead, dumping the air out and leading to all kinds of interesting follow through events before the scenery stops moving. And none of this is good, obviously. TPMS is an awesome early warning system against these kinds of catastrophes. And in this context, right, I'd suggest that Tim's TM TMS and TPMS or PMS, whatever, it doesn't sound like a chick though, whatever, it's functioning just fine. He has to remember to subtract the four PSI or whatever from the system and the messages it's telling him. If that matters, just remember 35 to 37, good, other numbers, bad. A monkey could do that. Scott Morrison could do that, almost. On a good day, with the grace of God, Donald Trump could, well, he's always got Jared on hand for demanding intellectual stuff like that, I guess. I'd suggest that one needs a TPMS calibration and possible replacement of malfunctioning sensors only if the actual pressure versus the indicated pressure varies wildly. If it's indicating three to five PSI different on three tires and 25 PSI different on the fourth, and you know that all those tires are actually at the same pressure, well, that's worth opening your wallet and investigating, I'd suggest. But 10 to 15% variation all around, just live with it, mate. Nothing is really accurate when you deep dive into it. There's just acceptable inaccuracy or unacceptable. Useful information and useless, trivial, unreliable information. Tim's TPMS information is still well in the useful domain. I think we'd all agree. Definitely keep checking manually with a gauge every two weeks too. That's a good hedge and great advice for everyone. I wish everyone did that. In addition to saving your life potentially, it will certainly also save you some cash because under inflated tires wear out really fast. And while you are 
down there checking things out. You can also look for signs of uneven tyre wear, which is a big fat red flag that you might need a wheel alignment. And you can also look for mechanical damage to the tyre itself, like, I don't know, a dirty big chunk miraculously missing from the sidewall or things of that nature. That's bad too, don't drive on that. Like most things on any car, okay, particularly one that you drive regularly, it's important just to keep track of what's normal and what's strange in the context of gauge readings and vehicle behaviour generally. Strange is usually bad. Strange readings, strange vibrations, strange noises, strange pool of whatever down there underneath where you park that car at night. At the very least, this kind of stuff warrants expert investigation which you do have to pay for, admittedly, but not always at a stealer ship if you are a PTSD sufferer. If you get onto this stuff early, okay, the silver lining is the repair bill is usually significantly lower and the risk to you is less. Thanks for watching.